watch. Uncle Owen. Yeah? It's our two unit has a bad motivator. Look. Hey, what are you trying to push on us? Excuse me, sir, but that R2 unit is in prime condition, a real bargain. Uncle Owen? Yeah? What about that one? What about that blue one? We'll take that one. Mommy, I am blue I'm quite sure you'll be very pleased with that one, sir. He really is in first-class condition. I've worked with him before. Here he comes. Okay, let's go. Now, don't you forget this. Why I should stick my neck out for you is quite beyond my capacity. How would you like to have a robot friend like that? It'd be great, wouldn't it? Mind you, the stories in Star Wars happen a very long time in the future. And the robots we have today aren't quite as clever as those two. But today's robots can still do some very useful jobs. Have a look at this. This is a factory where they make cars. But you can't see any people, can you? That's because all the work on these cars is done by robots. Robots like these are being used more and more these days in factories, doing jobs men used to do. They never make mistakes, they never get tired, and they never get bored either, even when they do the same job over and over again. But how do they know what to do? Well, this man is putting instructions into a computer, and it's the computer that controls the robots, telling them when to start and stop, which way to turn, and what to do next. Of course, it's not only factories that use computers. They're popping up all over these days in offices and airports. And here's another place we're starting to find them. Primary schools. Peter is playing with Big Track. It's a sort of thinking toy. It knows exactly where it's going and when it's going to stop. Hello, can I interrupt you for a minute? Now inside Big Track, there's a computer. Computers are a bit like our brains. That's the thing inside our heads that we think with. And it's thanks to the computer that we can tell Big Track what to do. And Peter is going to show us exactly how we do it. Right, Peter. Um, I see there's arrows and numbers here from one to 10. Mm. So does that mean that uh, if I pressed the arrow to go forward mm. and pressed the number one, would it go forward one sits own size? Mm. Right, I get the idea, but you know a lot more about it than me, so uh, can I ask you to make Big Track go forward for three mm. and then turn right for two mm. and then turn left for four? Could mm. you do that? So Peter pressed the arrows and the numbers in the right order to tell Big Track what he wanted it to do. Right. So what happens now? Well, you press go. Oh, press go. Well, I think I could just about manage that. Can I do it? Yeah. <laughs> OK. There you go, Big Track. And off it goes. Forward for three. Right for two. And left for four. Hey! That's very good. So that's how we do it. That's how we give Big Track its instructions. It's called programming. But what exactly is it inside Big Track that makes it remember everything we told it to do? Well, it's one of these. This tiny little thing in here is called a microchip. And everything we tell Big Track to do is stored on one of these inside the toy. That's hard to believe, isn't it? But it's true, and it's because of these microchips that computers can remember. These days, you find microchips in all kinds of things.
you find them inside little things like watches. And you find them in washing machines. And you even find them in things as big as space rockets. to Earth, or rather back to school, because now I'd like to show you another type of computer, one that's appearing quite a lot in classrooms these days. It's the microcomputer, the one with the television screen attached. You can use it for learning all sorts of things. Jay. Jenny and Depeche are using the cat and mouse program on this one. Every time a letter appears on the screen, they have to press the key with that letter on it. If they get it right, it helps the mouse get away. If they get it wrong too often, disaster. Alan and Mark are using a spelling program. When the words come up on the screen, they have to spell them on the keyboard. S H L Click. Click. The one who gets the most spellings right wins the game. Adele and Kate are using a different program. This one's a maths one, and they're doing some adding sums. Every time Adele gets one right, her man climbs one step up the ladder to the diving board. It's a great way to practice adding up. Kate's ahead of Adele, and I think she's going to win. See what happens if she gets this one right. Down. Adele's little man climbs all the way down. Then it's me star. And Kate's goes for a dive. Computers are very clever, but they can't really think for themselves like people. This robot's spraying the insides of cookers. That's what it's been told to do. It's all it can do. Look what happens if you take away one of the cookers, but you don't tell the computer that controls the robot. Well, the computer can't tell there's nothing there, so the poor old robot goes on carefully spraying an empty space. That's the thing about computers. You have to tell them everything very carefully. Here is a story about a man called Dr. Mindbender. Dr. Mindbender was an inventor and had a great many ideas no one had ever thought of before. He lived with this little dog, Sparky, surrounded by all the clever things he had invented. There was a computer in the kitchen, which was a kettle, toaster, and a microwave oven combined. At 7.30 every morning, it made tea and toast, cooked sausages, and rang a bell when it was ready. It also washed the dishes and cleaned the floor. The front door was computerized to open for people Dr. Mindbender wanted to see, but not for people he didn't want to see, who
who had to push notes through the letterbox. At 10.30 every morning, rain or shine, the doorbell rang twice and the door opened to remind him it was time for Sparky's walk. But Dr. Mindbender was finding that 10.30 was the time when he was really busy with the mathematical calculations for his inventions. So he decided to design a dog-walking computer that would take Sparky on his walk and bring him home again safely. He worked it all out electronically and built a microcomputer that could do this. Then he fitted it into a robot body with a head and arms and legs so that Sparky would feel he was being walked by a person, not a machine. Dr. Mindbender called his new invention Electronic Dog Walking and Romping Device. E D W A R D, Edward for short, and wrote out a program for it right away so that it could take Sparky for his walk the very next day. He put the instructions into Edward's memory store and went to bed. In the morning, when he was busy with his calculations, he heard Edward clanking about in the hall and Sparky barking. Then he heard the doorbell ring, the front door opened and closed with a bang. A success, he said to himself, and got down to some mathematics. After about half an hour, he heard Edward clanking back into the hall and went out to meet him. There stood Edward holding Sparky's lead with no Sparky on the end. There was no sign of Sparky anywhere. Dr. Mindbender got rather cross with Edward. Where's Sparky? he said. But Edward didn't say anything. What's the matter with you? Don't you understand when people speak to you? Then he remembered that Edward wasn't programmed to understand when people spoke to him, only to follow written instructions. He wrote a new instruction to Edward. Please print dog walking program. Edward put up a sign saying searching and then produced this list. 1. 10.25 a.m. Find Sparky's lead. 2. Find Sparky. 3. Fit lead to Sparky. 4. 10.30 a.m. Leave home with Sparky. 5. Take Sparky to park. If safe, take lead off Sparky for a romp. 6. After 30 minutes, return home. Yes, it was the doctor's fault. Instruction 6 should have read, After 30 minutes, return home with Sparky. Edward had only been doing what he was told. It was the instructions that had been wrong. Just then there was a barking outside the kitchen door. Sparky, being a very intelligent dog, had found his own way home. In the end, Dr. Mindbender let Edward do all his mathematical calculations while he took Sparky for his walks himself. After all, he said to Sparky, calculations are what computers are good at. Human beings are good at enjoying the sun and the air and having ideas. Sparky looked up at him. What about dogs? Well, said Dr. Mindbender to him, dogs are good at having fun and following trails. And, do you know, even I haven't invented a computer that's as clever as a dog or a human being. Well, perhaps computers aren't all that bright, but they are getting cleverer all the time. And I wonder what they'll be able to do in, say, 20 years' time or even 50 years' time. Perhaps you'd like to write about that. Or you could design your very own imaginary robot. If you had a robot that could do anything, absolutely anything at all, what would you program it to do? You think about that. Right, I'm going to have a go now. Uh, let's see, what happens if I press this one? Oh, what about this one there?